Okay, well, welcome everyone, and thanks very much for attending our College of Natural Sciences monthly webinar series, Pilina Ao. Uh, my name is Allison Sherwood. I'm the Interim Associate Dean for the College of Natural Sciences, and very happy to see you here today, and happy holidays to you. Um, through our webinar series, as many of you know, we're aiming to reach the broader community around UH and, and show a lot of the research that's happening both within our college and in our sister college, the Institute for Astronomy, sharing that around the campus and to um, various places around the world, including a lot of um, alumni and people who used to be associated with us. So it's good to see you all here. Today's presentation features Dr. Rob Jedeke from the Institute for Astronomy. Dr. Jedeke has had professional careers in particle physics, astronomy, and software engineering. He received a PhD in experimental particle physics from the University of Toronto in Canada. And interestingly, after a brief tryout with the BC Lions professional Canadian football team in Vancouver, he held postdoctoral positions at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory in Batavia, Illinois, and at the University of Arizona's Lunar uh, and Planetary Laboratory, where he worked on the Space Watch Near-Earth Asteroid Survey. He spent more than five years at Vico Corporation in Tucson, Arizona, developing image analysis software for interferometers before accepting a faculty position here at the University of Hawaii at the Institute for Astronomy. He was the development manager of their moving object processing system for the PanStars telescope on Maui, which is now the world's leading discovery system for asteroids and comets. His current research includes working with Trans Astronautica Corporation to develop techniques for mining asteroids to provide water as fuel for spacecraft, spacecraft missions. And so I'd like to welcome Rob. Thanks so much for joining us again. We're really looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much for the invitation, especially on the solstice, December 21st. The uh, sun reaches its lowest point in the sky at uh, 11 47 p.m tonight in hawaii and uh it's going to start heading north again so be sure to get your bathing suits ready for the summer but today i'm not going to be talking about the earth's motion around the sun i'm going to be talking about einstein versus santa in particular we want to know whether or not einstein or santa is guilty of breaking the laws of relativity and uh Oh, let's see. It's, it's a little chilly in my office right here. They like to keep the temperature pretty cryogenic. So uh, I'm just going to warming up here. Uh, I can I can see some of you laughing, I think, because I, I assume you're thinking that this means that I am not exactly uh, uh, objective about this. But I can assure you that I am a, a scientist. I'm a hardcore scientist. I am uh, extremely objective, which uh, makes me a little annoying at uh, dinner parties. But I, uh, I, I could be remain completely unbiased when it comes to Santa Claus. So, is Santa Claus real or not? Well, nowadays, what do people do when they have a question? They always turn to the internet. So, of course, you know we can believe everything that's on the internet. So, I went onto the internet and found this website called Ask500People.com. It was actually developed by a friend of mine, where you can go in, you can ask any question you want, and people from around the world respond. So I asked the question, is Santa Claus real? And I got responses from mostly from North America, but you know, for, with some distribution around the world. And uh, well, unfortunately, the results were not great for Santa Claus. Uh, it was 58% no, 42% yes, which is a wider margin than you know in most of our uh, elections nowadays but still not really that great for Santa Claus. But I, I don't actually think it's that depressing if we look in a little more detail at the numbers. Because the uh, website actually provides the answers and percentages from each different country. So we can focus in on, say, the United States, uh, where only 20%, 28%, roughly a quarter of the people responded that, yes, Santa Claus is real. That's kind of a disappointing turnout for the United States. But uh, on the other hand, uh, Canada, the country of my birth, uh, just to the north of the United States, uh, responded with 43% uh, yes. And uh, so I, that makes me very happy to think the Canadians are that much more optimistic about Santa Claus. And uh, I think there's actually a very good reason for that. I think that in Canada, we are uh, sort of, uh, we accept the idea of uh, men walking around in red jackets and leather boots. And in fact, I would even claim that the Canadian National Police Force, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, is uh, designed their uniforms based on Santa Claus, right? Same crazy, well, crazy kind of hat, red jacket, leather boots. 
Um, and I think that can go a long way towards explaining why Canadians are much more likely to believe in Santa Claus than the United States. In the United States, of course, your, uh, or I guess it's now also my uh, military, uh, federal police force looks like this, right? So uh, they are quite a difference from uh, Santa Claus compared to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Another way to split up the data from ask500people.com is to look at the results by uh, countries' religions. If we look at the uh, votes from uh, countries where you would normally consider them to be Christian countries versus other countries, 38% uh, of, uh, only 38% of people in Christian countries voted that Santa Claus is real, whereas in other countries, Muslim countries, Buddhist countries, they actually uh, voted for 60, uh, they, 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 they said Santa Claus is real in 61% of the cases, right? So it's kind of surprising, I think, that 50% more people in or as a percentage in the other countries voted for Santa Claus being real as opposed to the Christian countries. So let's uh, let's look a little bit at the origins of Santa Claus. Uh, Santa, Saint, Santa Claus is uh, probably based on Saint Nicholas is probably the primary inspiration for Santa Claus. Saint Nick was a uh, fourth century Christian bishop in a province of Byzantine Anatolia, which is now in Turkey. He was famous for his generous gifts to the poor, in particular presenting three impoverished daughters of a pious Christian with dowry so that they would not have to become prostitutes. So it's, I guess there's no surprise that St. Nicholas is the patron saint of children. I mean, you know, Santa Claus, children, that makes a lot of sense. A little surprising maybe that he's the patron saint of lawyers, but uh, maybe again, given the story about the three daughters that he saved from a life of prostitution, he's also the patron saint of prostitutes. So that's the uh, historical origins of Santa Claus. What about the modern origins of Santa Claus? Modern ideas of Santa Claus trace back to the 1823 publication of the poem, Twas the Night Before Christmas. So that's actually kind of interesting. I, I, I didn't realize that, that it's uh, only next year will be the 200th anniversary of the, of the poem. And it was uh, one of my favorite childhood poems, certainly around Christmas time. But uh, this poem was the first time, it was the first time that people suggested that Santa Claus used reindeer for his relativistic romp around the world. But the first really sort of modern rendition of Santa Claus, first image of Santa Claus that was drawn, was produced for Harper's Weekly in 1863, 40 years later, or about 160 years ago. But I think that, uh, I think it's undeniable that the Santa Claus that we all imagine uh, in our modern day and age is the one that's been created and refined by Coca-Cola throughout the last century. So I think uh, Coca-Cola has got a lot to do with the way we imagine Santa Claus. So that's the origins of uh, Santa, both modern and historical. What about the origins of Einstein? Einstein was born about 150 years ago, 140 years ago in uh, Southern Germany to his parents, parents Hermann and Pauline. Uh, he was a, a gifted child. Uh, one, of the, one of the myths about Einstein and that many people believe is that he did not have a lot of education or formal training, and that's blatantly incorrect. Einstein uh, was doing calculus when he was only 12 years old. I wish somebody had taught me calculus when I was 12 years old. And uh, Einstein had a PhD and was taught mathematics and physics, both formally and informally, throughout his childhood. So it's maybe... Uh, no surprise that he ended up being a mathematician. And for his work in science over the many decades of his career, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1921 for his services to theoretical physics and especially for his discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect. So I think most, most of us know about Albert Einstein and his theory of relativity, but the Nobel Prize, he only won one Nobel Prize, and it was for not relativity, it was for the photoelectric effect, which I'm not going to be going into today. But he uh, he should almost certainly have won two more Nobel Prizes, one for the special theory of relativity and one for the general theory of relativity, which we will be talking about today. So in the question of Einstein versus Santa, how will we actually answer the question of whether Santa Claus is real? Well, what we're going to do today is we're going to use the scientific method. And I'm just going to review the scientific method for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Poincaré said that science is built of facts as a house is built of stones. But he continued, but an accumulation of facts is no more science than a heap of stones is a house. I've, uh, I've looked and struggled many, for, for many years for actually a good definition of science. So I'm just gonna give my own definition. Uh, science is the process of creating an ever better description of how the universe works. And uh, I, I often am confronted by people who don't 
really understand the difference between a scientific theory and a uh, conspiracy theory. Uh, for instance, I often am confronted with uh, people who say, well, scientist X believes in the theory Y, right? And often when they say that they put an emphasis on the word believes and they say, scientist X believes in the theory Y, and then they might even go so far as to add air quotes around theory. Scientist X believes in the theory Y, right? So for instance, they might say that Dr. Robert Jedeke believes in the theory of relativity, okay? And, you know, I might even say the same thing if I was talking amongst my colleagues and we would say it, but um, I'm, I'm using these words very loosely. I do not like to use the word believe, actually. Um, I think that if I was going to try and describe what this sentence actually means in a, in a more correct way, I would say that Dr. Robert Jedeke accepts the mathematical framework developed by Einstein and known as the theory of relativity as the current best explanation of the observed effects of gravity and relative motion until it was proven wrong. So that's a mouthful, uh, much harder to say than Robert Jedeke believes in the theory of relativity, but it's much more accurate. And I think that probably the key point in that entire sentence is until it is proven wrong. That's the great thing about science is science is always trying to prove itself wrong. There are no final truths in science. And I think that's a really important statement. That's not true of a conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theories cannot be proven wrong. All scientific theories can or should be able to be proven wrong. So we're going to try and use the scientific method to determine whether or not there's any evidence in support of or to deny the existence of Santa Claus. The observation, the, the, the effect of the universe that we're trying to uh, describe with a theory is the observation that gifts appear under the Christmas tree the morning of December 25th every year. That's an observation. We all know that happens. And now we can develop a hypothesis to explain that observation. Now, hypothesis is kind of our first stab at what a theory is. A theory is a very, very well-established um, framework of uh, mathematics that describes a particular observation in the universe. But a hypothesis is now our first uh, sort of stab at it, our first idea, our first uh, attempt to explain what the how the observations can unfold. So the hypothesis in this case is that the gifts are delivered the night of December 24th, by a large man wearing a red suit, driving a sleigh powered by eight reindeer. So we're gonna test this hypothesis against observations and look for evidence and support or to deny Santa Claus. So we're gonna test the theory of relativity. We're gonna test Santa Claus against the theory of relativity. And why are we gonna use the theory of relativity? It's because the theory of relativity is a well-established explanation of the universe with more than a hundred years of experiments that have never proved it wrong. For a hundred years, scientists have been trying to prove the theory of relativity wrong and they have not succeeded. So that's a very well-tested uh, theory. So if so, I think we can assume for now that relativity as we currently understand it is very close to being correct. It actually is a real representation of the universe. So if, 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 if theory of relativity is correct and we can show that Santa Claus must break the laws of relativity, it would imply that Santa Claus does not exist. So what is relativity? Relativity is a mathematical framework that describes how time, speed, and mass behave, particularly at high speeds and under extreme conditions of gravity. When something is moving at high speeds, that is the, the, another word that we use to express when something's moving at very high speeds is that they say that it is relativistic. Relativistic simply means that something is moving at a significant fraction of the speed of light. So is Santa relativistic? And can we use his relativistic motion to determine if there's any evidence to support his existence or not? So let's talk about the origins of the theory of relativity. Well, it all starts out, I think, with uh, waves. And I'm not talking about water waves. Why? All the water waves are a good example of waves. Uh, waves, water waves carry energy through the ocean, through the oscillation of water, water, water molecules up and down in, in the water. And eventually when they approach the shoreline, they break as what we know as the waves. But it's just motion of water through the oceans. There's also sound waves. Sound, wave, sound is also a wave. In this case, the wave is uh, actually a, a change in the density of air that 
uh, that's caused by the vibration of molecules of air as they as they, as they move. So again, it's a transmission of energy through a medium of air molecules. There's also seismic waves. Seismic waves are actual waves transmitted through rock that are caused by the motion induced by an earthquake. So in Earth, this is a particular animation of an earthquake that occurred in Italy. And the, uh, the actual Earth, the surface of the Earth is actually waving up and down. The rocks of the Earth are waving up and down. So in this case, the rocks of the Earth are actually transmitting a wave of energy. So what about light? Light is also energy being transmitted, but light has uh, amazing properties. Uh, what medium is light traveling through at all times? In this particular case, we're seeing a lighthouse and the light is traveling through air. Uh, but we also know that light can travel through a vacuum. So what exactly is the medium that light is traveling through or what, what kind of mediums uh, are required for light to travel? So light is actually uh, different colors. Uh, light, is, light is a wave. And the different colors of light are due to different wavelengths of light or frequencies, right? So when the uh, wavelength of light is long here, it looks like red light. And when the wavelength of light is short, like here, it looks like blue or purple light. And we're going to talk a little bit about how light moves now in space. So light in space moves from the sun to the earth. We know that we get sunlight striking the earth at all times. But between the sun and the earth, there's nothing. There's, you know, maybe a few molecules here and there, but there's basically nothing. It's basically empty. It's just empty space with no matter at all in there. So what exact, how exactly does the light get from the sun to the surface of the earth? This is a question that perplexed scientists for quite a while, up until the uh, early 1900s. And uh, what they did is they, they came up with this idea that they said, that well, maybe the entire universe is filled with something that they called the luminiferous ether. The luminiferous ether was, was, was a material that they invented, they, they came up with to explain how light could get from the sun to earth. But the amazing thing is, is that light, because it moves so fast, and because light has got such high frequencies, it has to have, the luminiferous ether has to have some amazing properties. This includes things like, it has to be a massless fluid without viscosity. So massless, it has no mass at all, and it has no viscosity. Viscosity is a measure of how well a fluid flows, right? So without viscosity means that it flows perfectly. There's no resistance at all to its flowing anywhere. And that allows it to fill all of space perfectly smoothly. There's nowhere you could go in the universe where there'd be a, a little bit of a bunching up of the luminiferous ether, luminiferous ether or a place where there's less of the ether than somewhere else. And finally, even though it's massless and has no viscosity and fills all of space, perfectly smoothly, it has to be a million times more rigid than steel in order to maintain the high frequencies of light. So these are some pretty incredible properties. And even the scientists back then knew that it was pretty uh, hard, difficult to think about what kind of material could actually have these properties. So let's talk for a moment about how they went about trying to measure the properties, uh, or they, how they went about trying to measure whether or not this Luminar versus ether actually existed. So let's talk about relative motion first. So relative motion is, is pretty easy conceptually. Imagine we've got a baseball pitcher on the mound and we've got a catcher behind the plate and the pitcher pitches the ball at 150 kilometers per hour and ignoring some air resistance or gravity, the ball is gonna hit the catcher's mitt at 150 kilometers per hour, right? Now imagine this scenario. Imagine that the catcher is sitting on top of a fast moving car and the fast moving car is moving towards the pitcher. The pitcher pitches, the, uh, the car is moving forward at 100 kilometers per hour. The pitcher pitches the ball at 150 kilometers per hour. So imagine your head for a second or figure out in your head for a second, at what speed will the ball hit the catcher's mat? And if you said 250 kilometers per hour, you're correct. That's the relative speed between the ball and the catcher. So in the opposite scenario, where we've got the car moving away from the pitcher at 100 kilometers per hour, and the pitcher pitches it at 150, what speed will the ball hit the catcher's mitt? If you're thinking 50 kilometers per hour, you're correct. So this is the idea of relative motion. It's the relative motion of the ball and the catcher that determines how fast the ball hits the catcher's mitt. 
So let's apply this now to the case of the Earth going around the sun and light beams coming from a distant star. So here we've got the sun and the luminous ethers filling the universe perfectly smoothly everywhere. And imagine we've got light coming from a distant star and that light has got a particular wavelength. And the wavelength, if, if, if light actually changes its speed, that wavelength is sort of related to the speed of the, of the light. The earth goes around the sun. And uh, in this particular scenario, I've got the earth moving directly away from the motion from from the direction of the star, right? So it's moving directly away. So in this particular case, the relative motion of the light beam and the Earth should cause the light to be slower as a, as observed from the Earth compared to if you were stationary. In this scenario here, I've got the Earth moving directly toward the star, and in this particular scenario here, just like in the baseball analogy with the catcher on the car, the speed of light as measured from that orientation of the earth and the star should be should show that the light is moving faster and of course in this case that what that faster means is that it actually increases the frequency of the light and you know finally the the third example is that in this scenario here where the earth is moving perpendicular to the direction to the star there should be no observed change in the speed of light and so the wavelength of the light should stay the same. Now, you might think that this is actually uh, kind of a contrived experiment. This can't possibly be done. But in fact, it was done more than 100 years ago. And uh, it is very key part of the origins of Einstein's theory of relativity. These, this experiment was, uh, it's incredible to think they could do this. I don't think you could possibly uh, get this by an NSF or a NASA proposal nowadays, because it, what they did is they floated a granite block on top of a pool of mercury and they set up the system on it. Now, it's not really important to understand all the details of how this system works. It's incredible that they could do this more than 100 years ago. But what the, the key aspect is that this system allows you to measure the speed of light in different directions. So they can orient the, orient the system. They can rotate this granite block on top of the pool of mercury. And they can use the system to measure the speed of light in that direction or in that direction. So if they align that direction there with the Earth's motion, right? Then if you measure the speed of light in this direction, you should you should measure a different speed than the speed of light in this direction. And similarly, if you reoriented the system so that the Earth's motion was along this direction, then you would again measure a different speed of light than you do in this direction. So they actually did this experiment, like I said, more than 100 years ago. And it's a famous experiment in, in physics. It's called the Michelson-Morley experiment, because after the two guys that did it. And, uh, but it also has another name. It's also known as the greatest experiment that ever failed. Because when they did this experiment, and their experiment should have worked, given, given what we know about how fast the Earth moves around the sun, given what we knew about the speed of light at the time, they should have been able to measure the change in the speed of light in these different directions. They should have been able to do it. But what they found is that the speed of light never changed. No matter how they looked at it, no matter when they looked at it, they never ever saw a change in the speed of light. And the speed of light appears always to be about 1 billion kilometers per hour. So that seems absolutely impossible. How can you, you know, the, the idea, the concept of relative motion seems absolutely clear, right? I mean, the, the whole baseball analogy uh, is, is crazy. If you think about throwing a ball at 150 miles per hour, kilometers per hour, at somebody who's moving towards you at 100 kilometers per hour, and it hits them other, at other than 250 kilometers per hour, you'd, weigh, you'd say, well, how can that possibly happen? But that's exactly what's happening with the speed of light. The speed of light did not change no matter how they looked, in what direction they looked. So the speed of light they measured and it was well known at the time and has been very well measured now, is about a billion kilometers per hour. It's not exactly a billion kilometers per hour, but it's a nice easy number to remember. And a billion kilometers per hour is super fast. Uh, human beings, I think, have difficulty imagining numbers this big. So I'm gonna try and help you imagine the number billion for a little bit. So how, how big is a billion? Um, who do we know that you know might actually understand how big a billion is? Well, oh, one person would be Bill Gates. Uh, of course, now we could use Elon Musk or uh, Jeff Bezos, but you know, Bill Gates. We can ask Bill Gates to give us one billion dollar bills, not a billion dollar bill, but one billion dollar bills. And then we can uh, do a little 
sort of conceptualization with these billion dollar bills. Let's say that we uh, had the big the billion dollar bills and we tried to, uh, we, we actually could go to the equator and we could lay one dollar bill down uh, next to each other and sort of go all the way around the earth at the earth's equator, right? How many, how far would that go? Okay, just think about that for a second. How, how far would that line of dollar bills extend? Just take a wild guess in your head. If you said four times around the circumference of the earth at the equator, you'd be right. One billion dollar bills lined edge to edge like that could go four times around the earth. So a billion is a gigantic number. Another way to think about it is if you took those billion, same dollar, billion dollar bills, and instead of putting them edge to edge like that, you just laid them flat on top of one another, right? Just a stack of, of a billion dollar bills. That stack of a billion dollar bills would be a hundred kilometers high or 60 miles high. To put that into perspective, the tallest mountain on earth, Mount Everest is about 10 kilometers high. So it's a stack of a billion dollar bills is 10 times higher than Mount Everest. And it's about one third of the way or one quarter of the way to the International Space Station. Right? So a billion is a gigantic number. So why does the speed of light remain constant regardless of what direction you look? Well, scientists would say, because nothing can travel faster than light. And then you say, well, why can nothing travel faster than light? And the answer is because that's how the universe works. That's the whole purpose of science is to describe how the universe works. The universe works this way. That's what we're doing. We're explaining what happens. So let's move on to testing Santa Claus against the theory of relativity. We're going to do three different tests. And our first test is, does Santa have to travel faster than light? Because if Santa traveled faster than light, we know that would be impossible according to Einstein's theory of relativity. So if he has to travel faster than light, then it means that Santa Claus can't get his job done and it's a bad theory, a bad hypothesis. So let's review. How do you calculate speed? Speed is equal to uh, distance over time, right? So let's concentrate first of all on the numerator in this equation. So the distance that Santa Claus has to travel. Santa has to uh, visit the people all around the world. And so I've made this plot here showing the population of the world uh, from 1950 through now and extended and extrapolated out to 2050, right? So this is the population of the world. But you know, Santa's uh, problem isn't that he has to deliver gifts to everybody in the world. He only has to deliver gifts to the children in the world, right? So the children are a smaller fraction of the entire population, say people below, you know, 16 years of age, right? But, uh, you know, the problem isn't even that complicated because children, uh, he doesn't have to deliver child, gifts to all the children in the world. He only has to deliver gifts to the good children in the world. And so, you know, the number of good children isn't exactly equal to the number of children in the world because there's always some bad children that don't, don't get gifts. And uh, it actually gets easier with time for Santa Claus because we know now that, you know, there aren't as many good children now as there used to be in the past, right? Back when we were young, there were a lot more good children than now. So uh, Santa's, Santa's problem is difficult, but it's not as difficult as it would be if it had to, if you had to deliver gifts to everybody or all the children in the world, just the good children in the world. So. How does he visit all the good children in the world? This is a uh, problem in mathematics called the traveling salesperson problem, right? He's got to visit all the children all over the world, and he's got to do it presumably as efficiently as possible. And uh, so how do you actually get between two different points uh, as a fit or, or, or multiple points as efficiently as possible? That's the traveling salesperson problem. Let's say you've got these little stars here that each one represents a location, a house you want to visit or a place that a salesperson has to drop off some something. And uh, they could, you know, take some sort of random route between those different destinations. And that random route is obviously inefficient, right? There's, there's, there's got to be a much more efficient way to get between these different destinations. But, uh, and if you were a salesperson or if you were Amazon and you really want to maximize your profits, you would want to find a way to minimize the distance that you travel in order to save as much gas or time as possible, right? And it turns out that with this many stars, this problem can actually be solved exactly. And this problem is solved exactly with this route. This is the shortest possible distance between these particular locations, right? So there is no way to go faster or save fuel, more fuel than this particular route is the best way to go. So 
but the problem gets much more difficult as you add cities into the tour into the tour right if you just uh consider 3038 cities as you uh as as your as your destinations you have to visit there's uh almost an unimaginably large number of ways you can get through those cities this is the number of ways that you can travel between 3038 cities and of all those possible ways oh i just realized there's actually a typo here that should be a five right there sorry about that um the uh of all these possible ways we want to determine the most efficient way to get between those 3038 cities so that's that's it's very complicated now that the situation that Santa Claus has to deal with is even more complicated. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, the, a few years ago, this the the this website listed that there were over 1.9 million cities in the entire world. I mean, a city is uh, basically, uh, you know, any place that's got more than like a dozen homes or something like that. So this is a, just the distribution of all 1.9 million cities in the world. So if it's that difficult to find the most efficient route through 3,000 cities, how could you possibly find the most efficient route to 1.9 million cities, right? Well, I think what this implies is that Santa Claus has to have a supercomputing cluster at the North Pole. And using that supercomputing cluster, he solves that particular problem, and he figured out that the most efficient way to get between those 1.9 million cities is a route that requires only a distance of seven and a half million kilometers, right? So this is actually uh, this is actually done uh, on a computer, and it's actually uh, an extremely efficient way to get between all these 1.9 million cities. Uh, it, it, the, the, it's not guaranteed to be the most efficient way, but it is within a very, very small percentage of being the most efficient way to get around these cities. You can see that Hawaii is covered there, and uh, Every other one of those 1.9 million cities is in this uh, route. So this is the route that Santa Claus would follow around the world. So, but that's not the only problem, right? Because once Santa Claus gets to each city, he not only has to get to the city, but then he has to move between all the different houses in the city. So when we want to figure out how far Santa Claus has to travel, we can take into account the, uh, the population distribution of people on the planet. And so we can make some assumptions that there's a 7 billion people in the world. I think now it's up to 8 billion people. Uh, and that corresponds to roughly 1.4 billion households. Uh, let's assume that there's on average about 1,000 people per square kilometer. And that roughly there's 70 meters between households. And I know these are, you know, these, these numbers are not necessarily representative of what it's like where, where you live in particular. You know, you might live in a place where there's only 10 or 20 meters between households. But on average, let's say it's 70 meters between households around the world. And then it's pretty simple to calculate that the distance between homes in the world is about 100 million kilometers, right? So the distance between individual homes is much larger than the distance between the cities that, that Santa Claus has to travel. So the answer to the question of how far does Santa have to travel is the combination of the shortest possible city to city travel distance, about seven and a half million kilometers, combined with the intracity travel distance, the, the distance that he has to travel between the homes. So it ends up being only about 108 million kilometers. And 108 million kilometers may sound like a large distance, but you know, it's it's about uh two-thirds of the distance between the sun and the earth, right? The distance between the sun and the earth is about 160 million kilometers. So yeah, that, that's a, that's a pretty good distance for Santa Claus to travel, but light, the light from the sun travels to Earth in only eight and a half minutes. So that means that you know at light speed, Santa Claus could make this trip in uh, about five minutes. So Santa's annual distance is 108 million kilometers. So that we've now solved for the numerator in this equation. Now let's look at the denominator of the equation. How long does Santa Claus have? How much time does Santa Claus have to go around the Earth? So, you know, I think your your probably your first guess is that it's to 24 hours, but let's think about this a little bit more carefully, right? So let's think about this. So here's a map of the Earth showing the uh, time zones that Santa Claus has to traverse. And uh, let's say that Santa Claus starts at 8 p.m. on 24th of December on the west side of the international date line. Okay, so 8 p.m., that's after sunset, after the kids are in bed. So it gives him time to get down the chimney, deliver the gifts. But let's say then he continues to travel westward 
and he travels throughout the night and he can then end up on the time zone just to the east of the international time zone at 6 a.m 25th of december just before the kids get up right so he's traveled all night long but if you work that out it actually turns out to be 34 hours so santa claus has 34 hours to deliver all his gifts around the world so now we can solve the equation for the minimum speed that he has to travel at. That's 108 million kilometers over 34 hours, which is just 3.2 million kilometers per hour. And since the speed of light is a billion kilometers per hour, he's only traveling at 0.3% of the speed of light. Okay, so that's the minimum speed he has to travel at. So 0.3% is nothing. He's not relativistic at all. But there's some things we haven't taken into account. So we know we've taken into account the city to city travel. We've taken into account the intercity travel. But what about the time that it takes him to stop his sleigh? What about the time that it takes him to enter the chimney? What about the time that it takes him to deliver the gifts, spread them underneath the tree? And most importantly, what about all the time it takes him to eat the milk and cookies? And then, of course, after he's eaten the milk and cookies, he's got to get up the chimney. So if we add all these things together, oh, and then he's got to start the sleigh up again, right? So there's a huge number of things that are going on here. We've already established that uh, you know it takes him a long time to eat the milk with cookies. Now, let's say that he was able to travel at relativistic speeds, say very close to the speed of light. Well, then the dis time that it would take him to go from city to city would only be about 25 seconds. The time that it would take him to go between the houses within the city would be about 335 seconds. And that leaves him all the rest of the time to eat the milk with cookies and do everything else that he needs to do. So the total amount of time there is uh, 360 seconds. So we can take his speed now as 108 million kilometers over 360 seconds, which turns out to be 299,792 kilometers per second. And that turns out to be 99.9999% of the speed of light. So Santa Claus can travel at that speed, at this very relativistic speed. He can deliver all his gifts. And to every person at every household in every city all around the world, so does Santa Claus have to travel faster than light? The answer is undeniably no. He is not necessarily relativistic. He, he does not necessarily, but while he but he has to travel at relativistic speeds in order to actually have time to eat the milk and cookies and deliver all the gifts. So let's move on to test number two. Test number two: Does Santa Claus have to travel faster than light in air? Now this might seem kind of strange to you. Because, you know, most of us have heard the statement that nothing can travel faster than light. In fact, I think I may have said it even earlier. So the statement is that the conventional wisdom is that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. But that's actually just a, uh, a short form of the statement. What, what the, the actual statement uh, from a, from a uh, math, from a physical, from a phys physicist point of view is that nothing, information cannot be tra transmitted faster than the speed of light in a vacuum, okay? So that's actually, that's actually a different statement. And it's, it's an interesting difference between saying light cannot, nothing can travel faster than light, and then saying information cannot be travel, transmitted faster than the speed of light in a vacuum. But I'm not gonna go into the details here. So what we mean, right, is not that information uh, can be trans cannot be transmitted faster than the speed of light in a vacuum. We're not talking about this kind of a vacuum. You know, this is the Eureka Light Speed 200 vacuum. Um, the speed of light is uh, 299,792,458 meters per second, exactly, okay? So in a vacuum, out in outer space, nothing can move faster than that speed. But that's in a vacuum. When light's traveling through a material, it actually slows down. So this is a, di a, a diamond. And so if a beam of light enters into a diamond, it actually gets bent as it enters the diamond. And then its speed while it's passing through the diamond is only 40% of the speed of light in a vacuum. So it's, the speed drops a lot. The speed of light in the diamond is only about 121,000 kilometers per second. And then once it exits the diamond, it gets bent, this path gets bent again, and it once again travels at the speed of light in a vacuum, right? So when light is traveling through a material, it has to slow down, okay? So remember that. Now, how do we know that this is all true? To, do, to explore that question, let's uh, talk a little bit about the interior of an atom. An atom is often represented like as a billiard ball, and I don't like that representation. I kind of like a fuzzy ball. 
representation better. Um, think about this sort of being like an electromagnetic ball of energy, right? And that ball of energy is about uh, one trillion, one, one, 10 billionths of a meter across. Okay. And again, that's an unimaginably small size. So let's try and put it into perspective. This is a uh, hair, an individual human hair uh, blown up so you can see it here. And an individual hair has got about 1 million atoms across it. All right. So think about how thin your hair is. And then imagine there's 1 million atoms ac across each diameter of your hair. So that atoms are very, very tiny. And inside of an atom, there's a number of different subatomic particles. Uh, the one that makes it, gives it the fuzzy look like this, is the electron. The electrons are negatively charged, tiny little particles that are just constantly buzzing around inside of an atom. The electron uh, sometimes can interact with or emit photons. A photon is a, you can think of it as a particle or a wave of light, right? So electrons come off of the, uh, of the, of the, of the photons come off of the electrons. And if we looked at the very center of the atom, taking up a tiny, tiny portion of the volume in the very, very center of the atom, there's something called the nucleus. And the nucleus is made up of two different types of particles called protons and neutrons. But the protons and neutrons are not fully subatomic particles. They're not basic particles. Inside of the protons and neutrons are things that are what we think of as truly subatomic particles that have, that, that there's nothing smaller, there's nothing inside of them, uh, known as quarks. The quarks are inside the protons and neutrons, and inside of the quarks, there are inside inside the the, the nucleon is the, the generic term for the protons and neutrons. There are up and down quarks, and in between the up and down quarks, there are these particles called gluons that basically hold the the nucleon together. So these five particles here: the photon, the electron, the down quark, the up quark, and the gluon make up everything that you've ever seen in your universe. In the universe, everything. The, in you and me, everything in the sun, basically everything in the entire universe is made up of just those five particles in different combinations. Five particles combined in different ways create everything in the universe. Absolutely incredible. So let's talk about nuclear fission. Nuclear fission is when the nucleus of an atom spontaneously disrupts, or maybe on purpose disrupts. So uh, the, the uranium nucleus is the largest stable nucleus of, uh, of an atom. And uh, it's not, well, it's not stable, but it's the largest atom. Uh, it's, it's a very large atom, you say. And uh, this nucleus has got uh, 92, has got 92 protons in it and even more nu uh, neutrons in it. So let's imagine what happens in nuclear fission. What happens is we throw, we, uh, an atom, a, a nucleus of uranium gets hit by another neutron, and that causes the nucleus to fission, to split apart. That's what fissioning means. It means it splits apart. So the uranium nucleus, which is very heavy, splits into two lighter nuclei. But in that process, it also emits these other neutrons, right? So there's a whole bunch of neutrons that come off, and it also emits electrons. So nuclear fission creates lighter nuclei a bunch of free neutrons and a bunch of free electrons. But those free electrons are moving very, very fast. When the fissioning process occurs, it imparts a lot of energy to these electrons. It imparts so much energy to them that they speed off at nearly the speed of light. They speed off from the, from the nucleus at about 99% of the speed of light. Now, if that fission occurs in something like water, Right? So let's say that the nuclear fission occurs in something like water. Those electrons are now moving then at 99% of the speed of light, but they're moving in water. But the speed of light in water is 75% of the speed of light in a vacuum. In other words, the electrons can move faster than light in water. But that is an unusual situation. And, uh, and, and, and effectively what happens is the electrons try to break uh, basically, the universe tries to slow them down. They emit this thing, something called breaking radi radiation, uh, which is also known as Trenkov radiation. And Trenkov radiation is a high, a high energy, a very uh, high frequency light, and so it looks very blue. So I'm still trying to tie this all in here. So this is actually this is a real picture of a nuclear reactor where the fissioning of uranium is taking place. And this is not lit up with extra lights. This is the light that's coming off of the nuclear fission in the nuclear reactor. 
right? There's no, there's no strobe light. There's no flashlight. There's no nothing in, in inside the nuclear. It's dark. If you were to turn off the reactor, this would be a completely black photograph. But because the reactor is on, the fissioning process is creating these electrons. The electrons are moving faster than light in water, and therefore they emit the Trenkov radiation, which is blue, which is why this picture has this beautiful blue collar. So let's now consider Santa Slay, right? I mean, this is a high, high-end Santa Slay here. It's got a lot of different technology associated with it. Um, so it's got to be able to be a pretty high tech and have a lot of heat dissipating heat dissipation in it because Santa is we know is moving at about 99.97 percent of the uh, sorry Santa's moving at about 99.9999 percent of the speed of light but the speed of light in air is 99.97 percent the speed of light in a vacuum which means that Santa is moving faster than light in air okay so does Santa Claus travel faster than light in air? And I think we've just established that clearly he does, right? So what does that imply? That implies that Santa Claus must be emitting Trenkov radiation. And I think you'll agree that the evidence is pretty strong that every single time you see an image of Santa Claus, he's always surrounded by this ethereal blue light, which is clearly the Trenkov radiation. So therefore, Santa Claus is motion through the air at faster than the speed of light is consistent with the theory of relativity and the emission of Trenkov radiation. So finally, let's go to test number three. Are observations of Santa consistent with relativistic time dilation? So time dilation is this really interesting property of relativity that time actually slows down as you move at relativistic speeds. So let's take an example here. Let's take uh, two children, uh, two twins, and uh, one of the twins is very adventurous and takes off on a rocket ship that moves at 99.9999% uh, of the speed of light and goes to a distant planetary system, explores that system, and comes back. And they depart at, uh, 20, uh, at, uh, at, uh, in 2072, and they travel for 59 Earth years. And then, uh, sorry, sorry they, they travel for 32 and a half, 34 and a half years come back over for 34 and a half years. So 59 Earth years have passed. The child hasn't aged, right? If the child was actually on that spaceship going to that distant planetary system at almost the speed of light, the child would come back and the child would not have aged at all. At the same time, the child that was left back on Earth would have experienced time moving at our regular speed, at our regular time. And so it'd be moving quite, quite uh, fast relative to the, time, the speed of time on the spaceship. And that child would have aged to be 59 years old and be an adult, right? So this, is, this seems absolutely crazy that just by changing your speed that you can change the rate at which time passes. But this is true, this is relativity. And this, there is good, strong evidence for it. And what I'd like to talk to you about right now is the kind of evidence that we have to support relativistic time dilation. Let's go back to these uh, subatomic particles that we talked about. So this is the full zoo of uh, subatomic particles. And uh, so far, we've talked about the up, down, the electron, uh, up, down quark and the electron and the photon and the gluon. And there's these other particles out there, but they don't appear in, 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 in nature very often or stay for very long. But there's this one particle I want to talk about called the muon. The muon is not one of those fundamental particles that you and I are made out of. It's a, it's a particle that is very fleeting. It's, it's produced in, in uh, high energy subatomic reactions and lasts for you know, a tiny fraction of a second. But it's very important for illustrating time dilation in, in reality. Let's consider a muon. If you could take a single muon and you could just, just sort of hold onto it and, and suspend it in space, it would automatically self-destruct. It would take a tiny fraction of a second uh, uh, something like a millionth of a second, it would self-destruct, and it would create, uh, in the process of its destruction, uh, an electron and two neutrinos, which we're not going to talk about. But consider this electron here, right? So the muon lifetime is about, okay, so it's 22 millionths, to about two millionths of a second. So in just two millionths of a second, a muon will self-destruct and create this high-energy electron. And the high-energy electron is moving at basically the speed of light, and at the speed of light, you can move about half a mile, about one kilometer, in the space of two millionths of a second. 
So any muons that get created in this reaction should last <clears throat> for about two minutes of a second and travel at maximum a distance of uh, half a mile. So let's consider something called cosmic ray showers. In a cosmic ray shower, a particle from space hits something, hits an, uh, an atom in our atmosphere. It creates a subatomic reaction that creates all these different particles. And then those particles themselves can hit other particles in our atmosphere and create a subatomic reaction. And some of those particles are going to be muons. So these, part, these muons are created by particles that hit our atmosphere from outer space. And those particles that are, these muons that are created are created very high up in the atmosphere. So high up that at the, much higher than the half mile that they should be able to travel at the speed of light. But somehow these muons make it all the way from 15 miles high in the atmosphere down to the ground. So they travel 30 times further than they're supposed to if you know that they're traveling at the speed of light and there's no such thing as time dilation. But because the muons are traveling at near the speed of light, time slows down for those muons. Because time slows down, they live longer than they should as, as if, than if they were on Earth. So that means that they can live 30 times longer, even, even much longer than 30 times uh, the, the normal lifetime. And they can then travel much further than their half mile distance that they should be able to travel if they were traveling at just the speed of light. So this is direct evidence that time dilation occurs. These muons are living much, much longer than they should. So you might think that's all fine and wonderful, but what does it have to do with you? Well, it turns out that time dilation is at work all the time. Every time you turn on your phone and use your GPS, you are, you are uh, basically using a machine that is accounting for relativity. The GPS satellites that we use to, you know, to do our GPS tracking are uh, orbiting the Earth at about a height of 20,000 kilometers. And at that height, they're moving at about 13,800 kilometers per hour. And it turns out that the combination of their height above the Earth's gravity, where so the gravity is weaker up there, and the, and but combined with the their speed, which actually causes time to slow uh, to speed up for them, it actually causes the clocks on the GPS satellites to run at 38 millionths of a second per day different than the clocks on Earth. If this was not taken into account by the GPS satellites, we would not be able to navigate for more than a few days, probably on the, on the surface of the Earth. So what they do is when they build the GPS satellites on the surface of the Earth, they actually set the clocks so that they operate at a different speed than the clocks on Earth do. And then they launch them to space so that on in space, they're ticking off the seconds at the same rate as seconds click on the earth, right? So, so basically, if it wasn't for our understanding of general relativity, we could not use GPS to navigate. So, G, so general relativity is a part of our everyday lives through the GPS satellites. And Santa Claus, therefore, must use it as well, because he, of course, is traveling at 99.999% of the speed of light. Okay, so what does this all have to do with Santa Claus and evidence, you know, in support of Santa's existence? Well, Let's look at Santa through the 20th century. This is Santa circa 1930. This is an image of him created in, in, in 1930. Here's an image from 1943. Also Coca-Cola, 1954, 1961, and finally 2005. And I think it's pretty clear that Santa Claus hasn't aged, right? It's uh, 75 years and Santa Claus has not aged at all. It's clearly some time dilation going on there. And I think probably many of you, or some of you at least, have seen the uh, show uh, Santa Claus is Coming to Town. And you might remember that uh, Santa Claus, this is early, early days of Santa Claus, around 10,000 British uh, BC. So, of course, we see him look much younger then, but it took him 10,000 years to age just a little bit. So this is clearly evidence that Santa Claus is experiencing time dilation. So test number three, are observations of Santa Claus consistent with relativistic time dilation? Yes, certainly, based on the images that we've seen. So let's summarize our hypothesis testing, our scientific method. Is Santa's speed consistent with relativity? Yes, it is. He has to move at, he can move at much, much less than the speed of light, but he moves at close to the speed of light only because he wants to have time to eat his milk and cookies. Is Santa's faster than light in air speed consistent with observations? Yes, because he's moving faster than light in air, but that causes him to emit Cherenkov radiation, which we see in every image of Santa Claus that has this 
beautiful ethereal blue light. And finally, our observations of Santa are consistent with relativistic time dilation. Absolutely, he doesn't seem to age. So in the case of Einstein versus Santa, I think we have to come to the conclusion that Santa Claus is not guilty of breaking the laws of relativity. Meli Kikimaka, everybody. Thank you so much, Rob. That was really wonderful. And of course, well-timed in terms of our holiday season. It's always great to have you come back and speak to us. We will open the floor for a question. So if any of you would like to just ask a question directly, go ahead and unmute your microphone or feel free to use the chat box if you'd like to enter it there. Rob, I have to ask, how did you come up with the idea for this seminar? I was working at a place called Fermilab. My, my PhD is in particle physics, and uh, Fermilab is a particle accelerator outside of Chicago. Did my PhD research there about 35 years ago. And uh, they had this sort of uh, whimsical article basically outlining this idea and then I expanded upon it and you know developed the talk all around it and I thought I thought it was a really fun idea and I thought I could make a really interesting talk and I've been giving this talk for about uh 25 years now at different lo different locations any thoughts on uh whether the rules would be any different for the Easter Bunny <laughs> is the Easter Bunny international could be a lot easier I don't know if they have uh the Easter Bunny in uh, Europe and other countries. I was actually surprised we were in Italy over the fall and we saw lots of Halloween celebrations. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, American cultural imperialism is expanding all over the world, but uh, I don't know if the Easter Bunny has to, you know, get to Europe as well. So the Easter Bunny's uh, trip might be a lot more simple and, and not have to cover as much distance if it's only in North America. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Robert. Robert. Hey, Trinity. We're having some problems with our with our voice here, the, the computer. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much for a great talk. And the reason probably most of us don't have questions is that we're not smart enough to, to ask one. <laughs> but we certainly enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, well, the, the, of course, this is the difference between uh, this talk and a normal science talk where you're actually talking about, you know, real results that people have in question. So I, I understand. <laughs> Very good. Any questions? Would anyone like to ask anything or make any comments? You know, we have a question in the chat. Can you speculate yeah. about Santa's reindeer's power source? Well, it's, it's clearly got to be uh, some sort of fusion power to generate that kind of energy. Uh, you know, I think that's the it's the only uh, power. So I guess you could speculate that could be, you know, a matter antimatter reactions. Uh, that would have a lot more energy than even fusion, but uh, it's a lot more difficult to produce and uh, maintain uh, antimatter in a stable state that you can actually control it. So I, I, if, if, if it was, uh, you know, if I had to put guess on, I'd say fusion powered powers of reindeers. Very good. Thank you, Rob. We're really glad you were able to come and join us today. It was a wonderful talk. So thank you very much for that. And I'd like to thank our audience as well. Thank you all for coming today. Our next event is planned for Wednesday, January 11th at 2 p.m. Um, Hawaiian time. It's going to feature Dr. Peter Sadowski. Uh, Peter's a faculty member in the Information and Computer Sciences Department here in the College of Natural Sciences. And his work focuses on artificial intelligence and machine learning. So that should be an interesting seminar. Watch your inboxes for invitations to that event. So thanks again, Rob. Thank you all for attending. Have a wonderful rest of your day or evening and a really wonderful holiday season. Aloha.